Genesis chapter 5, if you would turn there, Genesis chapter 5, this is part of the Bible where, now I mentioned this last Sunday night, where we kind of want to skip over it at, and we ask the question, does this even need to be in the Bible? Well, it, it does, because it, um, it does several things. There was a man uh, by the name of uh, Bishop Unger that undertook the, I guess, the, the study of trying to determine how old the earth was based upon the genealogies that were given. And um, he used Genesis 5 for a big portion of that. And if you follow the genealogies and you kind of do your own study, you can sort of find out how many years it was between Adam and Noah. Uh, first of all, you find out how many, how many generations it was between Adam and Noah. Does anybody know that one? Just right off the top of your head. Eight or nine, or how about ten? Ten would be better. So in the tenth, you know, God, you know, part of, I'm going to have to teach this. God does things in an order. He has a, uh, he fashions himself, and the, and the earth and the universe that he makes, he puts them in order. We know, I mean, we know 20 years from now, on February the 2nd, what time the sun's going to rise. We know that. We know, we can predict then when the next... I mean, how, this lunar eclipse that we had right over Festus, how far back did they know that that was going to happen? A long time. Okay? So they predicted that. They, they knew when that would happen because God put everything in order. He set the, the earth and the sun and the stars and the moon. He set them in their, in their, um, their ordinations, their plans, their movements. He set everything and he did it in perfect order. And so, to me, it's no mystery. Enoch was the seventh from Adam. To me, it's, I get it that Noah was the tenth from Adam. And then you can keep on counting. Um, David, King David, who is a type of Jesus Christ, the, the one who puts down all of the enemies of Israel, he was the 33rd generation from Adam. Imagine that, okay? And, he's, and Jesus is always called the son of David, and David was the 33rd in the generation. So there's an order, there's a plan and a purpose to everything God does. And this is what we're going to concentrate on tonight, because this is part of the lesson. Uh, now, um, what's your name again? Sandy. It's been a long, rough day, okay? So Sandy worked out, uh, she did some things here, and she, she wrote out, uh, I was going to take a picture of it and put it on the screen, but um, she wrote out exactly who was the father of who, and how long they lived after they begat such and such. That's pretty good. 365 for Enoch. And some say that that number, well, there's 365 days in a year. You know, Enoch must represent that. I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you that. Um, there's a lot of things on the Internet that you can read about Enoch, and none of them are true. Okay? Part of it is that Enoch was given by God these secrets, and he hid them in these, in these pillars that would survive the flood. And, yeah, and that's all, that's baloney. It's all hogwash, and I know about hogwash, okay? 
So, um, so anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this. Um, Genesis chapter 5. This is uh, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. The day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them. And called their name Adam. Mentioned that last Sunday night. It's why man, the woman takes on the name of the man. God called their name Adam. So it's Mr. and Mrs. Adam. In the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years. Begat a son in his own likeness. After his own image. He called his name Seth. The days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years. And he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. And he died. So in this section, there's a pattern here. I want to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll look at it, all right? Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, a beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a little bit of rest today. And uh, thank you, Lord, for a little relief. Um, Lord, I love you, and I love serving you, and I love studying your word and talking about your word. And there isn't anything in this world that I enjoy more. And studying your word, testifying of your word, teaching and preaching your word. And Father, I don't like it when the devil tries to take that away from me. So Father, I, I thank you, dear God, for a good day. I thank you, Lord, for all these people that are with us this afternoon, both here and online. And uh, I pray, dear God, that your people would receive a blessing from this. And getting to know you, getting to know how this Bible is laid out, how perfect it is, and how to understand the patterns and the numbers and the things that you do. So, Father, just bless this tonight, and we leave this up to you. We ask you to be the teacher for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. All right, here's what I want you to do. Um, and Sandy, you can do this. You and Ron can put your heads together and do this, okay? In fact, here's what I'll do. I'll get my pen out. And I'll do what God led me to do. Number one, we're in Genesis 5. Okay? So, years ago when I was studying numbers, God sort of said to me the number meanings in the Genesis chapter. Well, you're to test those spirits to see whether they're of God or not. I mean, I could have, that could have been some devil trying to deceive me or whatever. Okay? So I said, uh, you'll have to prove that, okay? So the number one is beginning, that's Genesis 1. Number two is for division and union, that's Adam and Eve. Number three is for, like, part of the number three is for sin, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, part of life. And the number four is the gospel, and you have Cain and Abel representing the gospel story, the Cain is of the wicked one who slays Abel, whose sacrifice is accepted by God. So you have sort of the gospel story there. But what about Genesis 5? So I'm looking at 5. And, and I looked and I, and I saw that Adam's mentioned here. That's one time. Then in verse 2, he's mentioned here. That's the second time. Then in verse 3, he's mentioned here. That's the third time. Then in verse 4, he's mentioned here. That's the fourth time. And then verse 5, And all the days that Adam, that's the fifth time, lived were not in 30 years. And then here it is. And he died. Okay? So Adam is mentioned five times. And he died. So now, let's look at Seth, the second in line here. So we start in verse 3. Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. He called his name Seth. That's the first time he's mentioned. In the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth, that's the second time. 800 years he begat sons and daughters. Now Seth is not mentioned in verse 5 at all verse 6 Seth is mentioned that's the third time Seth lived in 105 years and begat Enos and that same pattern matches what you see with Adam the the 
Third time Adam is mentioned, if we go back to that, uh, it says he begat a son in his image after his likeness. Okay, so the same thing here with Seth. Third time Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. So then Seth, verse 7, the fourth time, lived after he begat Enos 807 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth, that's the fifth time he's mentioned, were 912 years and he died. Same pattern. So Adam is mentioned five times in five verses. The fifth time he's mentioned, he dies. Seth mentioned one, two, three, four, five times. And the fifth time he's mentioned, and he died. And if you keep going, you go to Enos. And so verse 6, Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. That's number 1. Verse 7, Seth lived after he begat Enos. That's the second time. Begat sons and daughters and all the days of Seth. He's not mentioned in verse 8 at all. Verse 9, same pattern that's repeated with um, Seth. Verse 9, Enos lived 90 years. That's the third time and begat Canaan. That's the same thing that was said with Adam and Seth. It's the third time they're mentioned. They begat the next son. Okay? And here's what's happening with this, with this number 3. Every time they're mentioned the third time, their name, when their name is mentioned the third time, it mentions that they give birth to the next one in the genealogy. Well, if you think about the number three and what it means, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, Adam passed his sin nature down to Seth. Seth passed his sin nature down to Enos. Enos passed his sin nature down to Canaan. And you see in, in this whole Genesis 5 here, when they're mentioned the third time, it tells you that they had another son. That son not only received the DNA of dad, but the sin nature of dad and his dad and his dad and his dad. So that we understand that all of us have received by Adam, by Noah. By, by the way, how many sons did Noah have? So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God shows us that order there. So then um, verse 10, and Enos, Enos lived. Let's see, we're doing Enos. So Enos, that's verse 10. He's mentioned the fourth time. Lived after he begat Cain in 815 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos, fifth time, were 905 years, and he died. And you can do that with every single person in Genesis 5. With two exceptions. Two exceptions. So, I've showed you the pattern. You go home then tonight, go back over Genesis 5, and count all these out yourself. Because I did, I looked at every one of them and I'm going, it's repetitive here. And here's, here's what God was telling me. Because somebody, I had mentioned in a, something I did sometime that the number five was for the rapture. Somebody wrote me an email said, Pastor, you know, I don't want to argue with you, but I saw the number five is related to death. And I went, <laughs> you just don't know how wrong you are. <laughs> and then when I started looking at Genesis 5, I went, Wait a minute. It is. The number five is related to death. Because look, look at the pattern. God's telling you in Genesis 5, everybody's mentioned five times and they die. The exception, the first exception. Well, we won't get to that yet. So let's go back a little bit to Genesis 1 and look and see what God did on the fifth day of creation. Genesis 1, verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales. Now, why did he mention that? 
Can you think of a story in the Bible that has to do with a whale? Yeah, it's the only one. Okay, there's only one story in the Bible. But why did God mention, have to go out of his way? I mean, we know whales live in the ocean. We know that sharks live in the ocean, but he didn't mention sharks. Why did he mention great whales? And every living creature that moveth with which the waters brought forth. And so then that was on the fifth day. Okay, so what does the whale have to do with death because the whale would have to have something to do with death if it follows this pattern okay so turn to Jonah and here's what's interesting while you'll find the word whale or whales in the King James Bible four times, you'll find great fish one time, which is what God said in Jonah 1.17. Okay? Now the Lord prepared a great fish. There it is. And how do we know that it was a whale that swallowed Jonah? Because Jesus said it was. Prepared a great fish to, notice the phrase, swallow up Jonah. Swallow up. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, in the very next chapter, uh, I'm not even in Jonah. Yeah, here it is. If you look in chapter 2, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and cried and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So Jonah's telling you the typology of what's going on. He's in hell. Okay? So then Jesus, Matthew 12, verse 40, says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And Jonas said it was hell, and this was done after Christ was crucified. So whatever this whale was that God prepared, we don't know if it was like a blue whale, we don't know if it was like a, a, a killer whale. The word used is a Hebrew word, tanin, which is also used to, and translated in the Old Testament as dragon, sea dragon. Okay? So... I believe that there was sea dragons. Rahab was, that's what Rahab was called. He was a sea dragon and he was mean and evil. The Leviathan of Job, 40, Job 41, Job 40, so the, well anyway, that, how God described the Leviathan is that he's huge, he's in the water, he's got fire coming out of his mouth. I mean, all of those things that mythology tells us, the Bible tells us, Job said they were true. And we get made fun of, we get ridiculed, and we'll continue to get ridiculed. Don't lose your faith, people. Don't give up believing this Bible. Okay? So, whale, four times. Great fish, one time. That's five times. So, Notice the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And 1 Corinthians 15, let's turn there. 1 Corinthians 15, because we'll see the defeat of death in 1 Corinthians 15. This is, and this, this is then how God reconciled what this guy was telling me that he thought the number five was related to death. I thought it was related to the rapture. And here's how God reconciled the two. The rapture is victory over death. Whether you've already died or you're alive when Christ appears 
and are translated without seeing death, it's the same thing. So 1 Corinthians 15, um, let's start in verse 50. Because the half of the last half of 1 Corinthians 15 deals with the resurrection and it being like a seed. And we've talked about that. So I won't cover it again. But verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption put inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, if I remember right, this is the fifth time the word mystery is mentioned in the Bible. Fifth time, if I remember right. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So everybody look up here. Here's what he said. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, number one, but we shall all be changed, number two, in a moment, number three, in the twinkling of an eye, number four, at the last trump. Five. There's five things that he says here about the rapture, the translation. Okay? So that, that goes along with the pattern that we saw in Genesis 5, where everybody dies, as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay? Let me think of how many piercings Christ had when they crucified him. One, two, three, four, five. And his death gives us our victory over death. Amen. You know, I've, I've, I've told you, one of the things that scares me is death. I've been near death before, and it was a scary experience I never want to go through that again so I've asked God God when you're ready to kill me I don't want to be afraid I don't want to be afraid because I know what I have waiting on the other side and once I get there, I won't want to come back. Never. Never. Okay? So, uh, let's read on down. Uh, where were we? We were in uh, verse 52. In a moment, in a twinkling of eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. It's in verse 54, matches Jonah 1.17. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is what? Swallowed up. That same, same word he used there, the great fish to swallow up Jonah. And ask yourself the question, was Jonah different after he came out of the whale than he was before he went in the whale? How? Number, yeah, number one, he was disobedient, didn't want to do it. When he comes out, he's going, I'll preach anywhere you want. And his flesh is probably very pale from the acid in the whale's stomach. He's a lot whiter than he ever was. Okay, so you see a pattern there now. That, that pattern means something. So whenever you see something 5 or 50 or 500 or 5,000, you're looking at a pattern that relates to death being destroyed by Christ giving his saints victory in the rapture. That's what it means. So, turn to Joshua 10. Um, when Elijah was raptured, remember Elijah? When Elijah was raptured, 
How many sons of the prophets were there watching it happen? It was 50. 50. What does the word Pentecost mean? 50. It's 50 days. Because that's how they measured the Pentecost. The feast of the Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. That's how they measured it. So Joshua chapter 10. Or, yeah, Joshua chapter 10. By the way, this is the same chapter where time stopped. That's what I believe. I could be wrong, been wrong lots of times. But I know that both the sun and the moon stood still. And what we use to measure time is the sun and the moon. And I think time stopped. I also remember when Hezekiah, and he got sick and he was going to die, and he went to Isaiah the prophet and said, I don't want to die yet. Fine, I'll talk to God. God said, give him 15 years. So God will give you 15 more years. What's the sign? Well, see that sundial? I can either make it go forward 10 degrees or backward 10 degrees. Hezekiah said, it's going to go forward 10 degrees anyway. So we'll make it go backward 10 degrees. So think about what would have happened then. They, time went backward. That 10 degrees was 40 minutes. Time went backward backwards 40 minutes who can do that god god can do that i mean think about the the motion of the earth and if all of a sudden you stopped everything from moving in the earth what would happen to the earth okay so that's my little theory but anyway joshua chapter 10 that's the same chapter that that happens so in verse 22 they, the, the five kings that they were, that they were going after were, um, they, they ran away from the battle and went and hid themselves in a cave. So when it was reported to Joshua, hey, those five kings that are over these cities we're trying to destroy, they ran and hid that cave. Joshua said, seal them in there. And wait till we're done with this battle. Then I'll deal with them. So after the battle, in verse 22, then, Joshua, then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave. And it says the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. These five kings are going to represent death. Kings means that they rule over people right now death reigns over us all does it not you're go it's like i said before you're going to die you're when you die of old age alzheimer's cancer run over by a car whatever you're going to die death reigns over as part of life the fact that we're redeemed is great but we still have to deal with death i don't like it i hate death it's my enemy i hate the sting of death but we have to deal with it so think of these five kings representing death so verse 24 and it came to pass when they brought out these kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. Feet, because you have ten toes, represents dominion. And when you're standing on somebody's face, you won. So these guys are standing on the they've got these kings laying down and they put their feet on the necks of these kings think of romans 16 where paul said may the god of heaven bruise satan under your feet shortly 
okay? Joshua could have done it, but he had his captains do it with him. He, this is Christ sharing with us his victory. Isn't that a good captain? Where when the medals are given out, the captain says, it's my men that deserve the medals. I just told them what to do. They did it. That's a captain, amen? That's one we'll follow. So, uh, they came there and put their feet upon the necks of them. Verse 25, And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. And that's what troubles me. Is I fear death. I don't just fear my death. I fear the death of my wife. I fear the death of my mother. I fear the death of my family, my in-laws. Bonnie had me worried. I fear death and what it does to people because it hurts them and it hurts them for a long time. Okay? But here's what Jesus said. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 15. Turn back there. Look at verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. You know who he's talking about? Adam and Christ. Because he says it in the next verse. For as in Adam all die. That's what I just quoted. As in Adam all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order... At, uh, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Verse 25, which is five times five, by the way. For he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. And then look at the next verse. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. Where did he say he was going to put them? Under his feet. So when you look back at Joshua 10, that's where they are. And he said, Thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And death is a killer. Death is our enemy. My body is fighting its own death off every day. It's fighting off infection that would take over and kill it fighting off anything that would enter the body that would try to harm it. It is fighting death while I'm standing here. My body is fighting against death. It is an enemy that I hate. So then, he said, this is what God's going to do to all the enemies against whom you fight. So then, verse 26, back in Joshua 10, afterward, Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. That's a picture of Christ. Joshua 10, verse 26. Joshua smote them. They smote Christ. Hung him on the cross, the tree. They hanged him on five trees. They were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And if you remember, when Christ was on the cross at the time of the evening, the Jews said, we had to get him down off there. That's our, that's our law. We cannot leave somebody hanging all night. That's, God said, don't do that. So they took Jesus down before it got dark. And they took these guys down before it got dark. It came to, verse 27, it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded. They took them down off the trees and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth which remain until this day. But Christ's stone was rolled away because 
He conquered death. So the people that I love, I'm going to see them again. Amen? And death won't sting anymore. It won't. Romans 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now think about this pattern. We just saw in Genesis 5 how that Adam's mentioned five times he dies, Seth mentioned five times he dies, Enos mentioned five times he dies. All these people mentioned five times and they die. But what about Moses? Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. How many books is that, Emily? Five. It's called the Pentateuch. Okay? Penta means five. And Moses died in the fifth book of the Bible. Look at that. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Okay? And it's all associated with the number five. Even over them that did not sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who's the figure of him that was to come. He's talking about Christ. Hanging on the cross. Being pierced five times. Taken down. Put into a cave. Great stone rolled away. Three days, like Jonah, three days in the whale's belly, in the heart of the earth. Then after that, the stone gets rolled away. Jesus comes back, and his body never saw corruption. I mean, that's, that's beating death. That's beating it bad, amen? Now, let's look at the one who did break the pattern. Turn back to Genesis 5. He breaks the pattern. Yeah, we've already talked about that. We've already talked about that. Genesis 5, verse 18. Jared lived 162 years and he begat Enoch. So that's the first time Enoch's mentioned. Where's my pen? Where's my little, there it is. So we have Enoch here, that's one. And Jared left after he begat Enoch, that's number two, 800 years. And he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 916, two years, and he died. And, and by the way, that, that would be the fifth time Jared's name is mentioned. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. That's, let's see, one, two, three. And Enoch... Here's the fourth time he's mentioned. Walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 306, 360, I don't know why that's messed up, 60 and five years. And Enoch didn't die the fifth time he's mentioned. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Amen. Enoch broke the pattern. Why? Um, turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were met, not made of the things which do appear. And by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, be, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated. That tells you, that gives you the explanation in, in Genesis 5, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. The Bible's not going to leave you with a question of how Enoch went from this world to heaven by saying, well, 
God took him, he killed him, and then he took him to heaven. Because it clearly says here, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And how did he please God? Verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. So this is why I'm telling you, don't quit believing your Bible. When, I, when they had me go down and preach down at Pea Ridge, I posted that sermon online, and I left those people, and I said, don't change. Don't change your Bible. Don't compromise your stand. I don't care if half your church leaves out of here. That pastor, Pastor Doyle, we had, Lisa and I had gone to his church before he pastored in Bentonville, Arkansas, and he had us down, what, three times, I think, something like that, three or four times. And he battled. He, there was an inner strife working inside that church. And there was some people that wanted to progress the church by bringing in the rock and roll music and the new translations and all that stuff. And, and Brother Ellis stood against it, and they voted him out. Get out. They put him out the door. That was, I felt so bad for him. But I'm telling you, I'd rather preach to three people sitting here and believe this book than to have a hundred people sitting here compromised. May not like it, but I'd rather do it than to compromise and change. Okay? This Bible is right. I'm telling you, it is right. By faith, it, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Even if you do good works, but you don't believe what God said, they're filthy rags in God's sight. So yes, do good things, but believe what God said. Okay? Um... Methuselah, and it talks about Methuselah, who was the oldest, 969 years. Nobody lived older than Methuselah, but he died as well. Same pattern. And then, we've already read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, very quickly. I think I'm going to get you out of here by 5 o'clock, because that's the number 5, we're, that's what we're talking about, number 5. I'll get you out of here, 5 o'clock. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That's the first thing that's going to happen. The second thing, the voice of the archangel. The third thing, the trump of God. Not the Donald Trump of God. He's got nothing to do with it. Number three, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's actually, that's number four. Then, verse number five, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That word caught up in Latin is rapture. That's why they call it the rapture. Using the word rapture is not some big violation of Bible doctrine. Because that's what it means. It means caught up. Together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And then it says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. So when I stand at a grave site. Like with Sister Bernice, it's the last one I've done. I gave those people comfort, or tried to. Letting them know, yeah, this is Bernie, Missouri, the big town of Bernie, Missouri. This is her hometown. This is where she grew up. This was where she lived. This was her favorite place in the world. So she's buried down here. But this is not her home. And I've got hope. That one of these days, she's coming up out of this grave. Sister Waymeyer is over here at Sandy Baptist Cemetery. The two ladies who helped start this church. Sweetest, best friends in the whole world they were. I have hope that she's going to be caught up. Wonder what that's going to look like. All these, I don't know if all these graves are going to burst open. I don't know if they're just going to rise up out of the ground and nothing happened. I have no idea. But they're coming up first. 
And then whoever is left alive on, on that day, at that time, we're going to be changed instantly into a new body without seeing death. Like Enoch and like Elijah, both of them are our examples of how we are going to beat death. Then, I'll finish with this. Back to Genesis 5, then I'll let you go. Noah broke the pattern. Noah broke the pattern as well. Enoch did. Um, Enoch's son died, being mentioned five times. Who was he? Did we say that's Methuselah? Yeah, he begat Methuselah. Then Methuselah is mentioned five times. He died. He, he had Lamech. And if you do the math on this, you find out that Methuselah died the same year the, the flood took place. And it makes you wonder, did Methuselah die in the flood? Did the flood kill Methuselah? We don't know. But he's the same year that Methuselah died is the same year the flood happened. Well, wouldn't that be a shame that Noah preaches while he's building this ark? Not even his grandfather will listen to him. Not even his dad will listen to him. It's just him, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And that's it. Out of all that it could have been millions. Henry Morris talks about that. Great creationist guy. He said by then you could have a population literally in the millions. After all of this going on. And every one of them perished. Except eight. It's not popular. To be right with God. But it is right. To be right with God. So Lamech lived in 180 and two years. and begat a son. Called his name Noah. That's the first time. This same uh, saying. The same shall comfort us. Concerning our work and toil of our hands. Because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Lamech lived after he begat Noah. Second time. 595 years. And begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah, third time he's mentioned, was 500 years old. And Noah, fourth time he's mentioned, begat Shem, Ham, Japheth. Probably, looks like they're all triplets. That's what I was thinking. It was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It looked like they were triplets. Okay? So he's mentioned four times here. Well, the chapter ends. What happened, to, what happened to Noah? We have to go to the next chapter, Genesis 6. But Noah found grace. That's the fifth time Noah's in it. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. So Noah, because of that pattern being broken, is going to be saved. Just like Enoch was. While the whole world perishes, Noah's going to be saved. Because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So I'm going to ask you as we close tonight, are you looking for grace? I'm all the time looking for grace. I want grace, I need grace, I have to have grace. Grace has to be on me every single day. Whether I'm doing well or I'm not doing well. If I'm having a good day, it's because grace. If I'm having a bad day, I'm still able to make it through it because of grace. That's the unmerited, unearned favor of God given to us. Amen. Father in heaven, I love you very much. 
And this book is wonderful. I could teach these things for hours. This book is so perfect. It's alive. It's powerful. And it teaches us, God, that everything you do is in order. And Father, I can always tell when there's an evil spirit about because there's chaos. I can always tell. There's always disorder. There's always something that's out of place, out of order, amiss. But when your spirit is there, everything is done right. And that's what the Bible teaches us. That's why Genesis 5, Father, is so important. Because you show us the order. Just like in Genesis 1, you show us the order of how you do things. And we thank you for that. Thank you for being a God that has everything right. Lord, my life without your word and your order would be a mess. So I thank you for the order that you set forth in my life. Father, bless the hearers of your word. Help us to be doers of your word as well and not hearers only. We love you and we trust you. Carry us through this next week. We don't know what's going to happen, but carry us through. We pray in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.